Hello everyone and thank you for coming to my talk. My name is Robert Barrett and I'm a postdoc here at Queen's University Belfast. I'm currently looking at lead 210 dating um, but today we're not going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about what I did for my PhD uh, which I recently completed um, and specifically we're going to be looking at 3D simulation um, which we're going to see uh, as a tool for archaeological inquiry and we're going to be using a test case from Neolithic Malta looking at astronomical alignments in Neolithic Malta. In short the question we're going to be asking today is can archaeological queries utilize 3D simulations to produce meaningful observations? Now, I understand that this may seem like a confusing question at first, um, if you're not particularly familiar with the field. Um, so I think I probably should start off by explaining what a 3D simulation actually is. What do I mean by 3D simulation? Um, so when you talk about 3D stuff in archaeology, usually you, you picture this kind of image. Um, you've got some 3D reconstructions there at the top. Um, you've got some photogrammetry at the bottom. You obviously have other techniques such as laser scanning, for example. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different uh, techniques that fall within the limits of 3D uh, archaeology. Um, but um, the main focus of these particular technologies is on visualizing uh, archaeology and, and showcasing how archaeology used to look like or how it looks now. Um, 3D simulation obviously borrows from the 3D field, but it does it in a very different way. You can see here, this doesn't look very pretty. and it definitely doesn't look very flashy like uh, like the other ones. Um, but what you can see here is uh, new information and new data. So while 3D reconstruction, photogrammetry, laser scanning are used to visualize something we already know most of the time, um, 3D simulation is actually trying to take that further and create new data, new information, test theories out um, to see if we can actually get some new understanding about some kind of archaeological query. And the way it does it is by using a system. Um, so this is quite similar to an experiment in a way. Um, what you have is um, a proxy for reality, right? Uh, on the right there, you've got a teapot. And although that obviously that's a photo of a teapot, uh, we can say that's a real teapot. Um, on the left, on the other hand, we have something which reflects that teapot, it represents that teapot, but it is obviously a bit simplified um, and a bit more schematic than the real teapot. But uh, although obviously there are some differences between these two images, um, you could argue that there are general characteristics that are comparable between the two. And, um, and it's by that comparison that we can create new knowledge because the system is formed up of uh, a number of different uh, elements. You've got obviously uh, data that you input into the system. You've got variables that you can um, manipulate and change around within a system. And there's um, uh, there's rules and, and, and uh, protocols that the system must obey. And by changing the variables, the data, the rules, you can actually um, change the state of this this system and by changing that state of the system that produces some observations right you see how the system reacts to certain changes now those observations are obviously very relevant for the system you're looking at but they also have some um, consequences for reality because of that kind of similarity between um, the proxy and the reality things that happen in the proxy do kind of um, carry on to the reality. Now, this is all very theoretical, so I'm going to go for a practical example. You can see here, this is an archaeological site. This is the site of the Shara Broktov Circle in Malta, which is an underground burial site. Um, on the left there, you've got a photo of the site as it stands today. It is vastly overgrown and very un inaccessible at the moment. Um, and what I did with that reality, I then replicated it into a 3D model. And you can see that in the middle there, um, which is clearly a representation of that archaeology. It clearly has a strong connection to that archaeology, but it is simplified and it has a few theoretical elements added in as well. And then that 3D model, and this is the step where you go into 3D simulation territory, um, I use that 3D model as a basis for some visibility analysis. So um, I created new data, some new visibility data, um, which gave us a better understanding of 
how certain elements of the site were used to block out vision in certain areas. Again, I don't want to go into too many details because obviously this, this is quite a big piece of research. Um, but essentially the point is we created new information that is related not only to the 3D model that is there in the middle, but also to the archaeology itself. Um, so yeah, so we can use 3D simulations to test hypothesis um, without impacting the original. And that's something very important in archaeology. 3D simulation is non-destructive. You don't have to actually, um, you know, do experimentation on site, which could obviously cause damage. And it can work with more hypothetical elements, so it's not constrained by the limitations of archaeology. Um, as you know, archaeology obviously has a limited archaeological record because of just destruction throughout the ages. And 3D simulations can work around that with obvious you know, limitations. So that's kind of a theoretical thing today. Um, to, to, to show you how we can use 3D simulations to actually answer archaeological queries, I want to talk to you about Malta. So Malta is the small island in the Mediterranean. It's actually a series of islands, but there's one big main one. Um, and in Malta, what you have um, was, well, what you had was a big civilization um, that developed in the Neolithic. So between 3800, 2100 BC, roughly. Um, and this uh, civilization was very was quite advanced and the main thing we have remaining of the civilization are these temples so you can see here some examples um they're big megalithic structures um which are dotted all around the islands of malta um and we suspect they were used for some kind of ritualistic practice although obviously that's still a bit debated at the moment um but um you can see in this photo here we have quite a lot of them there's about more than 30 um, that are still standing, uh, others which are known but we we have lost since, um, and others which we probably haven't found yet. Um, so there's quite a lot of them, they're quite spread out throughout the Maltese Islands. Um, so yeah, so it's a good sample size of um, this ancient structure. And although obviously there's variations, uh, the temples do follow similar patterns. So these are the temples of Gigantia, and you may notice, especially if we go to the plan a second here, um, that the main um, plan of the temples is you've got these central corridors, uh, and either side of the corridor there's apses, these semicircular rooms essentially, and at the far of the corridor, far end of the corridor, you have an additional apse, or if it's smaller, a niche. Um, you do also have multiple temples, one next to each other, like in this case, this is Gigantia North and Gigantia South. And yeah, you do have exceptions, but they generally have the same plan of central corridor, apses on the side, apse at the end. Um, and obviously there's lots of theories and lots of uh, hypotheses to do with uh, the Nephic temples. The one that we're going to be looking at today specifically is to do with astronomical alignments. Because you get a lot of these kind of articles in, in uh, especially local papers, but also international papers. Um, sun worship in the Hypogeum, uh, Sun worship and Malta's megalithic temples, Sun worship in ancient Malta. So a lot of sun worshipping apparently happened in these temples and um, this is because um, if you look at the, the orientation of the temples um, you will notice that there is some a tendency for them to be um, orientated towards particular solar events. Um, in the upper right corner there you can see uh, that's a, um, I think that's a temple of Menagerie and it's uh, showing how on the equinox um, you can see the sun raising absolutely perfectly in the middle of the entranceway. Um, and if we look at the orientation of all the temples there on the left you can see that there is patterns of orientations. Um, there was obviously some exceptions, but the vast majority of the temples seem to sit in the southeast, quite bundled up in the southeast as well. And in the southwest, there's another kind of cluster there as well. So people have spent years, years and books and books discussing the potential astronomical alignments of Neolithic Malta. Um, and people have gone to all the different temples and tested out all kinds of theories uh, to do with astronomical alignments. Um, for example, this is the temple of Menagerie. Um, and Menagerie is, is a big focus of all this research. 
Um, and what you find in Menagerie is that the central axis of the temple is pretty much spot on with the uh, equinoxes. Um, so when the sun is rising for the equinox, and you, if you were standing at the back of the temple, you'd see the sunrise at the, in the entranceway. Uh, and you can also have other um, kinds of alignments as well. There's so, the solstice, winter solstice, summer solstice alignments in Menagerie as well that have been identified. Um, so there's a lot of potential alignments here. And people generally go to a site, they kind of look at where the sun is rising in certain days and find all kinds of alignments, not just to the sun, to the stars, the moon, all kinds of stuff. And you get this a lot in archaeology, so this is rel related not just to... Um, Malta, but to a lot of other sites. Obviously, Stonehenge is always the centre of, uh, you know, sun worshipping or, or whatever astronomical theory. And also, you know, tombs in uh, Ireland. Um, I'm familiar with some research which has suggested that they are themselves oriented towards the sun or the moon or some astronomical body. So, this is where the 3D simulation comes in. Because when I was looking at this information, it looks very convincing. But then when you start doing the maths... There's a bit more to it. So if we look, for example, at this particular temple, which is Menagerie Mid Menage Middle, I believe. Um, so with this temple here, uh, we have a number of potential alignments, one being a major lunar standstill, which is the kind of middle one there. But you also got a winter solstice alignment, which people have suggested. So that's the one which has uh, 117 degrees there. You can see it. And... The idea is that um, the idea that I had was that yes, if you go to that site, you will see the winter sol winter sun rising in the entranceway. But what's the chance of that happening randomly? Okay, so let's say that um, you have um, the the entranceway. You know, there's there's a certain degree of leniency you can have. Um, so if you want the the winter solstice sun to rise anywhere in the entranceway, right? That basically it has to rise anywhere between 117 and 145 degrees. Um, so if you flip that arrow the other way around, that would be 145 degrees. So that is 28 degrees. Okay, so it means that if that temple was aligned within an arrow of 28 degrees, you would be able to see that sun rising. So the chances of that happening randomly. Um, so say say you were to like orient a temple to any kind of random direction that you wanted, anyone at all, um, the chances of that catching the coincidental, you know, catching that particular angle is 7.77%, okay? Um, so 7.77%, pretty low. You could say that's, you know, that seems to suggest that it's, it's not random, that it could be intentional. But this is one temple in Malta. And if we start looking up, 23 temples, say, which are the, the better preserved ones, if they all had a completely random orientation, yeah, um, the chances of one of them happening to, to fall within that 117 to 145 degree angle is 99.9%, which means that if it was completely coincidental, all these temples were randomly aligned, then uh, one of them would very likely be aligned to the winter solstice. Um, and you can test this out if you want. I, I here I've generated 23 random numbers between 1 and 360. And as you can see, the red one there, that one is aligned to the winter solstice. And these are completely random numbers. So imagine these are 23 temples with completely random orientation. One of them is aligned to the winter solstice. Okay. So, um, so what what can so how do we know if something was intentional or not? Or more correctly, how do we know if something was is significant or not? Okay, how do we know that these temples were aligned towards those specific astronomical bodies? One thing you can do is obviously look at um, the archaeological record, and there are examples of astronomical symbolism in Neolithic Malta. But the other thing you can do is try to do some statistical analysis on. Um, a whole data set of temples. You're not looking at individual temples, but you're looking at if there's patterns throughout all of the temples. Because if all the temples are aligned to the winter solstice, that's a lot more than just a coincidence. If just one of them is, that's not significant. If a lot of them are, it starts to become significant. So I wrote a piece of software, this thing here, it's called Tarshin Core. Uh, you input, uh, you know, various uh, um, 
latitude, longitude, altitude, horizon, all these kinds of information. You put, you can input, you can input a specific date, and it will show you uh, where the sun is in that specific date. Or you can loop it and basically get the alignments throughout an entire year, for example. Um, and this is based on this book here, Astronomical Algorithms, which is a fairly complex book, um, which I've obviously translated into code um, so that it knows where astronomical bodies are placed in the, the 3D model. And the idea um, behind this um, is the thing I was trying to look at essentially is to do with the precision of the alignments. Okay, so 28 degree angle of acceptance is too wide. I was trying to work out what's the minimum that it would be acceptable. Um, so the thing we're looking at essentially is this. So you got a temple there. Um, the far left uh, dot is, imagine you're standing in that spot. That's where you would be looking um, for this astronomical alignment. The middle dot is the entranceway of the temple. So where you would see this cosmological body rise and then the one on the far right is uh, the astronomical body that we are considering let's say the sun for this particular example so um what uh, what you can do is you can calculate the um the angle of the temple so you know the orientation of the temple which in this case is 127 degrees and in theory if this cosmological body is precisely aligned with where you're standing and the entrance of the temple, these three dots should be in a straight line. So a straight line should intersect all three of these dots. Now, in reality, this doesn't quite work because there is obviously a bit of error. Um, and if you go into a temple like so, uh, you can see that the, the, the dot from the entrance way isn't perfectly aligned, right? But we have two numbers now. We have this number here, which is the angle of the temple. We've also got this angle here, which is the angle between the back of the temple and the cosmological body. And the difference of those numbers is how accurate the temple is aligned to that particular cosmological body at that particular point. Okay. So, um, so this particular value here is the one I was trying to work out for each temple. Um, and I did some field experiments, uh, which I don't have time to go into right now, but I can obviously go into um, in questions if you have any questions. Um, I worked out that uh, about 2.795 degrees was an acceptable level of error for your temple alignment, which means that if they were intentionally trying to orientate the temple, they should be able to get it within 2.795 degrees accuracy. Okay, so um, the thing I did then was I calculated the um, orientation for all the temples or I mean the error in orientation um, with all these astronomical bodies throughout these 23 temples to try and identify um, where basically this number was very very low so where these temples were very accurately oriented towards this particular cosmological body um, so for example this is the maximum declination of the moon which occurs once every 18 years I believe uh, yeah, um, and if you see here, you can see that, for example, Borgin has very low numbers, and that means that it is quite closely aligned to that maximum declination. Okay, Hagakim, on the other hand, um, they has um, a much more margin of error. So although it is visible in the door frame, it's not precise enough to be accepted based on the uh, parameters of the research. So. Um, in this particular case here, although Bergenado does seem to have a strong alignment towards it, none of the other temples do, essentially, which means that it's very unlikely that that is significant, okay? Same with the winter solstice. We looked at all the different temples, and the only one that seemed to have any kind of suggestion of, of a winter solstice alignment is Hagakwim, and that is very low. Now, spring equinox, Menagerie South, which is the temple we saw earlier, has a very strong alignment with it. It seems very consistent, but none of the other temples do, which means that either they decided to do it for this one temple or it's completely coincidental. Now, the thing that did come out as significant, and this is the, uh, the interesting part, is the Crooks, which is the Southern Cross constellation. If we see the Southern Cross constellation is formed of four different stars, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, and Delta Crooks, and if you look at the graphs for each of these, you can see that it's really lit up. These these values in pinkish orange color means that they're very precise. So a lot of temples are very precisely aligned to these different stars. Obviously not all of them, but there is 
quite a significant number. So I did some maths and the chances that 9, because 9 of temples are seen to be significantly aligned, 9 out of 23 temples are aligned to this southern cross. Uh, the chance of this happening randomly are 0.00018%, right? So incredibly low chance that this is just a random coincidence. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's um, we, we found the pattern, essentially, in the orientation that would suggest that maybe these particular temples are intentionally aligned towards this Southern Cross. And we do actually have some evidence of the Southern Cross in the archaeological record, although quite scarce. Um, so that's something that is very interesting. Um, but there's also um, some other factors that need to be taken into account. For example, wind direction, um, because the wind is predominantly north from the northwest. If you were facing your temples downwind, you would potentially face them southeast. And um, that extra variable would um, change the, pos the possibility of um, the temples being aligned to the Southern Cross. So you'd only get 5.07% chance that that was a, a, a random um, alignment. Um, so that's just to say that although um, this research is bringing new information, new new facts to the, the, the problem, new, new fresh data essentially, um, this is not final, there's still a lot more work to be done. But one thing is certain is that this whole idea of sun worship in ancient Malta seems to be disproven. There is no alignment, no significant alignment with uh, any kind of solar event, and therefore it's very unlikely that the Maltese had a, a whole sun worshipping cult within um, their own belief system. So the reason we've been looking at this piece of research is because uh, obviously it's an example of 3D simulation, um, because we used 3D modeling and experimentation using coding, but um, it's not only providing, um, it's not only de showing old data, but it's actually actively creating new data in a way that you couldn't do physically. There were millions of calculations done by the computer for each of those alignments. And for, for to be able to obtain those graphs uh, by hand, it would take you years. And we could do it in a few minutes. So it's producing new data, new information that is breathing new life into old archaeological queries. And this is just one example. There's so many different applications. There's other research I've done um, on you know roofing analysis, all kinds of stuff that um, can also demonstrate how useful this kind of technology is to um, archaeology in general. So um, I'm already over the time, so I'm gonna quickly close up. These are different acknowledgements. Um, obviously it's based on my PhD, so that's the funding body, um, and you can contact me down there below. Thank you all for listening. If you have any questions, there'll be a question section and I'll be here to take them. Thank you all for listening and I hope you have a good rest of the day.